Now, as Parliament behind me right now debates who's in charge, let's hear from two people who have years of experience of seeing the workings of government up close. Jonathan Powell was Tony Blair's Chief of Staff, serving in Downing Street from 1997 for a decade. And Jill Rutter is a former senior civil servant who is now at the Institute of Government. Jill Rutter, who is in charge? It's not clear. I mean, we're going to find out tonight whether Parliament tries to take control from the government, so control some of the business, so it can organise these so-called indicative votes, probably on Wednesday. The Prime Minister has said, well, actually, she would do that anyway, but she's very unwilling to concede the principle that the government isn't in control. So it's, it's a bit of a tussle going on at the moment. What is not clear is it's bringing us any closer to a solution. Well, your experience is as a civil servant, but your experience is in there. What's going on? Well, it's a mess, and it's been a mess for quite a while. This is a death rattle of a regime that is falling, and no one is in command, no government is going on. You go to any of the departments down here in Whitehall and no one will be doing any work at all. So, I mean, can MPs actually literally take control? Can MPs run the government? No, of course they can't run the government. So what MPs could do is they could control the order paper for a day, that's what they're trying to do. They could say, these are our views, we don't know whether the indicative votes will actually produce any sort of workable solution. There are two risks, one of which that nothing commands majority, the other one is that something commands majority but is actually clearly unnegotiable. So those are two big risks. But what, uh, what Parliament can't do is then go and take those propositions and take them over to Brussels and say, hello EU, we're Parliament, we've come to negotiate on behalf of the UK. Only the government can negotiate with the European Commission with the European Council. So either the government has to be prepared to be guided by Parliament, the Prime Minister was making it pretty clear today she wasn't that keen on that, or you've got to have something which triggers a change of government. Well, now, I'm going to put you back in your old job, 10 years experience. You're in there, you have a crippled Prime Minister. What are you going to tell her? I would tell her to resign. She's gone on far too long. It's time for the hand over to someone else. I think the best possible outcome of this would be our government of national unity. Actually bring people together in the middle, the moderate centre, who can take control in Parliament, who can agree on an option, and then with a government of that sort, you could actually negotiate, get a delay, and get a sensible outcome. Could that be achieved without a general election? So it could, it could be achieved because, you know, under the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, we could have a no-confidence vote. Uh, there's then two weeks to see whether there's an alternative government that could be formed. So somebody Jonathan approves of could emerge as a leader of that group. If that then, that government can then win the confidence of the House two weeks later, then actually they could go on and govern. And so, you know, that's really Parliament taking control, which is substituting the current government with a government, if you like, that emerges from hmm. Parliament. But Tony Blair, for example, would never have given up control to Parliament, would he? Well, Parliament was always in control. Parliament was in control on the vote on Iraq, for example. He had to win in Parliament. That's why it's a very odd thing for the Prime Minister to start attacking Parliament. She only is there because she has a majority in Parliament. If she starts attacking it, she'll lose that majority. And that's what we're seeing now, is she does lose control. What about something people don't seem to talk much about, revoking Article 50? That's clearly a possibility too. She clearly wouldn't want to do that, but if she handed it over to someone like David Liddington, who could then ask for a long delay, that would be an option they could look at. I mean, in doing that, you could say, well, let's park this, let us now really draw up a proper way of doing this, if we really want to. Would you favour a second referendum then? That's not a constitutional... Yeah, well, it's quite interesting, because it's quite difficult to revoke Article 50. There's been a European Court judgment which says we can do that unilaterally, but only if it's with the intention of staying. So there might be some challenges if we were clearly just doing it to buy ourselves a bit of time and then wrote another letter saying, can we have another two-year period starting now? We could see that you know, this ends up in another referendum. One of the uh, amendments that we're not talking about today but might come if she brings back her meaningful vote is this idea that MPs agree to put her deal or maybe some other slight variant on a deal through at, subject to it being confirmed in a referendum. So we might see us getting into a referendum as that's the way of bringing two sides together and creating majority. We've just seen young people who want to go into British politics and, and make it work. I mean, what chance have they got given? I mean, is the thing fatally flawed? Does there have to be a public inquiry? Who knows? Well, having been subject myself to about seven public inquiries, I'm quite in favour of these people being subject to one too. And I think there is a case for having a proper look at how this came about, because it is the most almighty mess, the biggest mess since the Second World War. And I'm actually very gratified to know that young people still want to go into politics despite what they've seen. 
and goodness knows we need a new generation taking over. Have a leader of the opposition about to be 70, someone in their 60s as prime minister. It needs to be people in their 30s and 40s taking control of this, a new sense of optimism and a new look at the future. But one wonders whether this issue just simply fails to fit the paradigm of this kind of party politics in, in, in the Commons. The I think system. that's right. I mean, I think the party system is really one of the problems here. And it's massively difficult for parties to cope with Brexit, which is an issue which splits both parties. I mean, it started as a problem in the Conservative Party, which they sort of exported, though, uh, across the SNP unified, the Lib Dems unified, but both Labour and the Conservatives find this very difficult to deal with. So I think one of the really interesting things with your young people earlier is do they actually want to join the current set of parties or do we need a really big shake-up there and would that make it more appealing for them to go in and provide vehicles for them? I'm going to have to thank you both very, very warmly for coming, Jonathan Powell and uh, Jill Rotto indeed. Thank you very much indeed.